It's well documented that the path to the modern era of the NBA was blazoned by Steph Curry. By shattering every three-point record on the books season after season, he was rightfully crowned as the poster child for unleashing a whole new off-the-dribble long-distance shooting attack that had a number of guards follow suit. But was he really the first to do this? I won't blame you if you don't know that back in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a guard who could light it up in much the same way as Curry, from deep and off the bounce. And it's an important story to tell, since his name should not be forgotten in the annals of basketball history, as his contributions to the game are profound and deserve real attention. Let's go back to 1988, where a freshman at LSU named Chris Jackson burst onto the scene, dropping over 30 a game on a decent team that won 20 games that year. But what you'll notice right off the bat is how quickly he attacked, didn't wait for the offense to set up, and just hunted buckets off the dribble. Coming off pick and rolls might look like the norm now, but let me assure you, in college back then, hardly anybody ever ran them. And if they did, you'd never see a three-point shot taken. Never. And here comes Jackson raining down threes, long twos, floaters, and finishing strong at the rim even though he's shorter than I am. I had the pleasure of interviewing Mahmoud Abdul Raouf as part of the Big Three playoffs where he was an instrumental part of the three-headed monsters at age 50, proving that guys who can get buckets can always get buckets. So I'm, I'm your age, I grew up the same time. I was a good shooter from yeah. three, but we we would get benched and cut the, from the team if we shot a three off the dribble. <laughs> so I'm curious, what, what, how do they, why did they allow you to do that? And did you feel like a pioneer even back then? Well, I mean, um, I was playing that way coming up through junior high and high school. Really? So when they're used to saying that it's easier to allow a guy to do it. I tell guys all the time, if, you, if you're going somewhere and people don't know you, people are watching when you, least, when you, when you think that they, they aren't watching you. So even in practice, get in practice, lean, before you start playing with somebody, because you have to train a person's eyes to get used to seeing it. If a coach is not used to seeing it and all of a sudden you pull it and you miss, it doesn't look normal. But if he see you working on that stuff in practice and all of a sudden you do it every now and then, it's like, okay, you've trained his eyes to uh, uh, look for those things, and now it doesn't look so alien to him. His college exploits led him to break several freshman scoring records, first-team All-American, and SEC Player of the Year two years in a row. And that led the Denver Nuggets to draft him with the third overall pick behind Derek Coleman and Gary Payton. And while his Denver team led the league in three-point attempts that year, it was only 12.9 a game. And Jackson was stuck behind another point guard who dominated the ball and actually shot a lot of threes for any era in Michael Adams. The irony that Jackson got to the one team willing to spread the floor and let him shoot threes off the dribble, only to already have that guy playing over 35 minutes a game, is all kinds of unfair. The Nuggets traded Adams away the next season, but started poor shooting Winston Garland instead, leaving Jackson to get a meager 19 minutes a game. It was at this point that Jackson changed his name to Mahmoud Abdul Raouf and converted to Islam. While the NBA had seen players do this in the past, most notably Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, this would become a source of controversy later. By his third year, the Nuggets finally saw the light and installed him as a starter, where he promptly led the team in scoring. And here is where he had a three-year run of off-the-dribble highlights that we just hadn't seen much from any player, much less the point guard. Back then, point guards were supposed to be passed first, and rarely did you see winning teams have points that led the team in field goal attempts. The Nuggets steadily improved with Abdul Raouf running the show. But I'd argue he wasn't unleashed enough, primarily to take more threes. The reason Michael Adams took over eight a game in 1991 was because the head coach was Paul Westhead, where, at Loyola Marymount, he became one of the architects of modern basketball as we know it today. His teams pushed the ball fast and spread the floor for lots of threes. 
but by this time, Westhead was long gone, replaced by a traditionalist in Bernie Bickerstaff. And Mahmoud did the best he possibly could with an offense that simply wasn't allowed to take threes at all. By 1995-96, he was officially unguardable, handing a great jazz team and John Stockton 51 points from all over the floor, including off the dribble threes as well as kickouts from the post. No matter where the defense was, it didn't matter. Then, he led his team to one of only 10 victories opponents had over arguably the best team ever assembled in the 72-10 Chicago Bulls, filling it up for 32 points against an assortment of players, including Michael Jordan. And they even unleashed him from three-point land a little bit. His career-high 5.4 attempts served to open up the floor for everyone on the team, and without question, this is what led him to his best overall season of his career, handing out a career-high 6.8 assists while also nailing 39% of his threes. If you're enjoying this kind of detailed insight into Abdul Raouf's game, you've got to check out our friends over at Playmaker. They do videos on the best NBA players and how they execute their pet moves. To give you insight into how much of a craft Abdul Raouf considers the art of shooting, he told me that great shooters can't be satisfied with just making the jump shot. But for me, it's a little different. I'm always trying to not just think about making it. It gets to the point of how you make it. That's when you get to precision shooting. Uh, there are people that are happy just making 10 or 20. But then it's like, okay, I want them to go all net. I want them to come back to me. I want them to go off the glass and go in. I want them to go off the glass and go all net. And that's when you, that's a whole different ball game, uh, a whole nother level when, when you get into shooting. And then you're working off the dribble. You're imagining people swiping at the ball. You imagine the hand in your face. Mm -hmm. And the more you do it, it becomes like second nature. Um, and I think this is the best way to train. It's like Bruce Lee said back in the day, boys don't hit back. So you want to train as if though someone's there. With this type of mindset, no wonder he was such a good shooter. He also has Tourette syndrome, which was almost an advantage for him. Despite having tics he couldn't control, his need to practice until it quote unquote felt right gave him an incredible work ethic required to achieve the kind of skill level and finishing ability that most six foot guards can't muster. This should have been the beginning of a seven or eight year run of all-star games, accolades, and the inspiration for a generation of young guards unleashing off the dribble shots from behind the arc. Instead, he's largely forgotten, barely a footnote in the oral history of the NBA. How could we have gone from a singular talent who was a better shooting version of Allen Iverson to a player who was out of the league within two years? For several years, Abdul Raouf did not stand for the national anthem before games. His faith in Islam demonstrated a strong dedication to living a principled life. In protest of the oppression and racism that exists to this day in the United States, he would either continue stretching or stay in the locker room while the anthem was sung. In March of 1996, a reporter did a story on this, and it became a sensation. And rather than honoring his constitutional right to express how he felt, the NBA suspended him for a game, the Nuggets benched him, and within two years, he was completely out of the league. While we are blessed to be able to still see him filled up with the big three, looking in good enough shape that you might think he could still get on an NBA court, let's not forget the legacy he left. As one of the first guards to utilize the pull-up jump shot from distance to level the playing field for all the smaller guys out there, making them as valuable, if not more, than the traditional big men that the NBA has valued for so long. Who knows? Maybe it was playing against him that made Steve Kerr believe in the off the dribble three and unleash this weapon in the Warriors offense. And the next time you see Steph Curry hit a three pointer and celebrate in the way back down, give a salute to Mahmoud Abdul Raouf while you're at it. And don't let anyone forget who he was and what he stood for. <laughs>